What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello and welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie, where we believe in experience becomes truth. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and Eddie Connor is back next week. But until then, we have back in studio with us co-hosting. We have world-renowned astrologer and radio personality, host of Listen Up right here on UBN Radio. Rachel Lang is in the house and back with us again. We have Captain Ron, also a UBN Radio host, host of the Elevate the Conversation with Dr. 420 every Thursday at 9 p.m. on Channel One. All right, so history seems to be the theme of our shows today. So we look at history to be a learning tool to help change the world for the better. But there are times in history that just don't make sense. Today we have New York Times bestselling author Julia Shears with us to talk about her book, A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Jonestown. Almost 40 years have gone by and we still have questions to be answered and why almost a thousand people left everything behind to follow Jim Jones to Guyana and in the end lost their lives with Jim Jones, some voluntary and some forced. Let's let Julie take us on the journey of Jim Jones and maybe even see why they followed his godlike presence to the end. We know a lot about Jim Jones, but let's find out about the people that followed him. So let's welcome to Truth Be Told, best-selling author, Julia Shears. <laughs> there she is. Julia, how you doing? Wow. That's, that's quite a welcome. <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> we didn't tell you that we yeah. brought a lot of people into the studio that wanted to talk about Jonestown. Jonestown. <laughs> I was waiting for everybody to sit together. So, yeah. Anyway, so thank, thank you. you for being here. It's going to be a great show uh, because we are all here to learn. We're all here because I'm a big history buff, and I think history is, a, is something that we can learn from, uh, you know, being a tragedy or something amazing, uh, such as landing on the moon. We can always learn from it. So, uh, But let's learn from Julia today. Let's learn what, uh, what brought you to write. Well, you, you have a best-selling book, but, but we're going to talk about that another time. <laughs> but we want to talk about A Thousand Lives, the untold story of hope, deception, and survival at Jonestown. What, what brought you to want to write this book? Well, I was actually working on a novel about a charismatic preacher who takes over a small Indiana town. I'm from Indiana. Oh. Nice. Uh, and then I, I was stuck, and I Googled Jim Jones, remembering that he was from Indiana, and I discovered that the FBI had released all of their I- archives on Jonestown. Ooh. And like a few years, I, I did research. And then being a journalist, of course, you know, I, I got very excited about that. You know, forget the novel. It's harder to sell. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know, right. I know how to write journalism. I've always been fascinated by Jim Jones. So I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to the oh. FBI. Wow. And cool. they, they sent me all of their files on three CDs. Amazing. They did just... Yeah. For- they just sent it to you. They, you didn't have to do much other than just the Freedom Act. That's cr- crazy. I mean, what, what did you find? What did you find in there uh, when you got the file that uh, you did not hear before? Well, first of all, let me tell you what was on those three CDs. Oh, tell me, tell me. It's, okay, so the FBI had scanned 50,000 pages of documents 50? that wow. FBI agents found in Jonestown. 50,000 pages. Did you read every one of those pages? <laughs> oh, my God. It, it took me a year. Oh. It took me a year to go through those CDs. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and here's the thing that complicated it is that they didn't include an index. And oh so a document that might have started on CD1, page 92, would end on CD3, page 2001, oh for example. Yeah. It was, it was truly a... 
it was pretty epic. She didn't drink before. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I drink a lot of coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah, I know. Right, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's that is fascinating to to think that they didn't have it in any type mm-hmm. of form. I mean, especially the FBI. Yeah. I mean, apparently, they they must not have reviewed it too much because you think they would have put it in 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 order. Yeah, I don't I don't know why it was in such a disarray. I was actually really surprised at that. And of course, the FBI was no help in trying to help me with the project at all. Um, There were a lot of concerns because of the people who died, you know, their medical records included. And, and, you know, so they tried to strip strip out identifying information. They redacted the articles, which means there's these big black stripes where you can't read the lines. So I had to work around that, you know. So the big black, you know, blot out would obscure, you know, names and Mm -hmm. dates an identifying characteristic, who was supporting Jim Jones in his quest to kill everybody, who ordered the cyanide, all of this really juicy information. And guess what? what? Just when I was getting ready to hand the book in, the FBI released unredacted versions oh, of all of those files. No! no. Well, yes. well, but I would imagine that going through all of that and putting it together and P- it was part became part of the process where you, I mean, you probably learned more and were surprised by more facts and more information through that process. Would would you agree with that? You know, if they had just like given me the unredacted versions, it would have made my life a lot easier. <laughs> I, a lot of- <laughs> I moved. I moved. I had a baby. I had a miscarriage. It was it was oh, chaos. Man. And then wow. you know what? But it's but it is. It's a much better book because yeah. now I can name. I can name names. You know who right, right. who did what. Right. So yeah. so did you do more research on the? I'm going to say victims or followers uh, than sure. you did on uh, Jim Jones, or equally. You know, I did because there is a, there's a wonderful biography of Jim Jones. Mm-hmm called Raven by Tim Reiterman. He's a journalist. And this is what Jim Jones wanted. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to go down in history. In fact, that's what he told one of his lovers shortly before the end. He said, mark my words, I will go down in history. He did. What what Mm -hmm. a heck of a way to do it. (laughs) He wanted, so quite honestly, every time that I wrote about him, I... I would have to do it through gritted teeth because I hated him so much, mm-hmm. and I hated, you know, giving mm-hmm. him what he wanted. Well, it, right, it's true. We 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 always say we don't want to glorify anybody that does wrong, but we have a for yeah. some reason it's human nature just to be curious on yeah. on these type of you know Charles Manson and all mm-hmm. these type of people. Right. Um, so, uh, when when did you discover, or it may not even be in your book, but when did you discover that Jim Jones? had that ability to influence people to do mm. things that most people like us were like, oh, that wouldn't, I would never do that. I would never fall for that. That's but, what we said before yeah. she came out. We were like, How, uh, that wouldn't happen to me. But then we thought those people right. probably felt the same way. Yeah. But when did, when did you think that he started getting that manipulation to where people just followed him like, like, like sheep? All right. Well, first of all, we have to go back to the beginning Please do. of who Jim Jones was. Okay, so in Indiana in the 50s, Jim Jones was a civil rights leader. He was a pastor of a church. He was going around integrating lunch counters, integrating churches. He was preaching a message of social justice and racial equality. Hmm. You know, things that really appealed to a lot of people, not just African Americans, but progressive whites who wanted to be part of this movement towards, you know, a better society. So that's what drew people to him more than anything was this message because he was militantly in favor of social justice and would talk about this a lot. So this is how he built his congregation in Indiana was through this message and also because people saw him as a faith healer. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you also have this segment of, the, you know, people who were raised in that tradition or mm-hmm. who weren't so savvy, maybe unschooled, but they believed that 
certain creatures. I mean, Pat Robertson, right, was big back in the day, right. had this ability to heal people through their touch. And Jim Jones was one of those healers. I mean, it still happens today in certain denominations. So he also attracted a lot of those folks who, wa- who wanted some type of healing. So when he, he was in Indiana, and then where did he go mm-hmm. from there? So from Indiana, he, when was it? It was around 1965. He had this uh, vision, he said. He was obsessed with the Third World War and nuclear war. Nuclear. He had this vision, he said, that a nuclear bomb exploded over the Midwest. And that they should all move. And so he moved his entire congregation, about 150 people went with him, to Redwood City in Northern California to begin again there. Right? So this is the core of his congregation, the true believers who really believe he has this power to heal or believe in his mission of social justice. So it was in Redwood Valley for several years and then ultimately ended up in San Francisco where he could attract much larger crowds and actually became a political player. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I've watched documentaries where you could definitely tell. I mean, he, even though he was a minister, you could tell he had a politician inside of him. Oh, yeah. Totally. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. So when he went to San Francisco um, yeah. and... His congregation, when he came out here, was like, what would you say, 100 and how much? 150. 150. 150. What did that grow to in San Francisco? In San Francisco, I mean, they didn't keep really good membership numbers, but Mm -hmm. it grew to be about several thousand. Some people estimate around 3,000. Yeah, so what he did was, you know, he when he moved into the city, he bought this old temple where he set up. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was this giant building in San Francisco, and they had a soup kitchen, they had uh, child care, they had health services for senior citizens, so really a ton of outreach in the city, doing a lot of good. Like, you know, there were all kinds of puff pieces written about people's temple before it all went south. Because I was going to say, so far, point. she's making everything very positive. Yeah. Like, like, this like, is a yeah. good guy. Right, right, right. He's like civil that. rights leader, he's preaching positive oh, yeah. messages. Yeah. So far, so good. To the housing, he was appointed to the Housing Commission here in San Francisco, right? He was awarded that. So what he did was he helped get George Moscone and um, Harvey Milk, the supervisor, city right. supervisor, elected in 1975. Wow. Right? Because he would send all of his thousands of members out to, you know, cross voting lines to... <laughs> canvas door to door. I mean, he was really a political force to be reckoned with. Was any of that motivated by sort of a, a desire to stay in power or to, to have, um, to be able to get away with certain things? Well, well, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's been, it's a conundrum and I, it's a, one really good question that no one really addresses is whether he truly believed in this message of social justice mm-hmm. or if he stumbled across this equation or this, this message, this gospel that drew a lot of people to him. That is because, good. you know, mm-hmm. mid-60s, early 70s, there was a lot of turmoil in the United States around race. Right, right. Right. And so it resonated with a lot of desperate folks. Mm -hmm. So not only that, he would also take these tour buses on the road and he would be in these convention centers and he would invite people like, you know, you're poor, you're hungry, you can't afford to feed your kids, just step on the bus, come with us, come back to San Francisco, we'll take care of you. So a lot of the folks who joined his church were quite desperate. Well, that's, you know, that's the people you want to... Yep. That you want you want to pull into your congregation okay. people that are mm-hmm. people that are desperate. Uh, so I keep thinking that you know do do people change that much from a child to an mm-hmm. adult, or was it was it the drugs or mental mm-hmm. illness or something that set in that 
change Jim Jones? Did he really ever believe uh, before mm-hmm. in social justice at all? Do you know? Well, these are these are very good questions, right? Because not only did he integrate his church, he integrated his family. He mm. adopted the first African American child into a white family when he was in Indiana. In Indiana, but then he adopted um, a couple of um, Korean kids too. Mm. And it came out much later that he molested his Korean daughter. There you go. You know, yeah. so. I think there was a bit of of mental illness there all along the way. I mean, if you look at it, a lot of serial killers or, you know, people who commit crimes are very charismatic and know what to say to draw a crowd. Right. right. So Jim Jones was was one of those. Now, did did uh, I'm trying to think when when I watched the documentary, was there was there another was there other powers that be in his church that uh, were equal to his uh, level, or was he the top dog? Well, he was definitely the top dog, but he did have an inner circle of mainly lovers, male and female, that he, um, you know, that did his bidding, and, and most of them had the same type of nihilistic outlook as he did. You know, so in Jonestown, when he was arguing that they should commit this thing called revolutionary suicide, these people would fully support him, right? But, and here's my, the central argument of my book is that it wasn't voluntary. It wasn't suicide. It was mass murder. Right. And let's, let's talk about why. So what happens in the late 70s? He decides to start this agricultural project in in Guyana, South America. Right. Right. And the reason and the reason for this is that they wanted to establish this utopian society where there would be no racism, no racism, no classism, society. Right. And so the idea was that people would in the church would start the society and it would be of the to San Francisco. In Oakland, kids could run around safely. They'd all be educated. There'd be enough food. They'd live off the land. Um, and Guyana had put out this international call, looking for people to come to settle its what they call the hinterlands, the jungle, because Guyana could not grow enough food. So they're looking for outside groups to come in and try and raise the jungle and plant crops. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the benefits of Guyana is they're English speaking and also the majority is black, just like uh, Jim Jones's church was. Right. So the idea was is that they were going to go down and establish the society where, you know, and if people didn't like it, they could return home. What happened? <laughs> they get down there. Jones has made all kinds of promises about food, about families living together, about, you know, safety they get down there and they, and they find that as soon as they get to Jonestown, which is a two day river journey, somebody takes away their passport, their mm-hmm. money. And Jim Jones tells them, if you want to go home, you can bleep, swim home. Cause I'm not paying your way home. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Right. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, he is censoring, you know, this isn't, Today, there's no internet, there's no cell phone right. service in the middle of the jungle. The, the only way out is mail. So he is reading all of the letters that people are sending out from Jonestown to make sure they don't say anything negative about the compound because he's trying to get as many people to come down as possible. But but was there a reason, though? Wasn't there a reason he left? Wasn't he under investigation, though? And the, mm. one reason that he left the States? Well, that is a good, that's a good point. So they were always planning on this, building this utopian community. Right. But in what was it, late 1977, there was a, a, a magazine called The New West that was about to publish an expose on Jim Jones and his church, talking about people being beaten, talking about Jim Jones sleeping with his congregants, right. talking about you know, misappropriation of funds, 
And so before this article could hit the newsstands, Jim Jones made this concerted effort to get as many of his congregates down to Guyana as possible. So they had buses pulling out of the church parking lot 24-7, just getting to people to the airport, getting as many of the congregants down there as possible before this news broke and their families could, you know, could come and, and basically confront them about with this information because a lot of the congregants didn't even know what was happening in their church. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, if you've ever belonged to a church, you know, you have one relationship with your fellow congregants, the other families and kids and people you meet, but the, the minister kind of operates in those churches on his or her own level. Mm-hmm. And so th- there could be a lot of things going on that the minister is, you know, private, personal life that you would know nothing about. The same thing with people's temples. Wow. Well, I, I, I know, like I said, when they, when they went down to Jonestown, they created their own town, Jonestown. Uh, yeah. And then what, how long was it before, uh, I guess, was it Congressman, what was his name? Uh, Ryan. Ryan. Leo Ryan. Leo Ryan. <laughs> how long was it before... Or how how did that actual letter get out? There had to have been a letter or something get out mm. that J- Jim Jones missed, or did he miss it? Or how did that get back to the states? All right. Well, let me tell you what happened. So what happened was, you know, people get down to Jonestown. There's not enough food. They can't grow any food in the jungle because the topsoil is only a couple inches thick. Right. Right. So nothing grows there. There's bugs. There's weeds. It's hot. They don't know what the heck they're doing. They're a bunch of inner city folk. And <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> people, people are starving. You know, they go through the food line and are, and are handed a slice of watermelon, for mm. example. Oh. Um, he is l- using sleep deprivation to weaken them. Oh, he, right, mm. so he would keep them up all until really late at night, you know, talking to them in the pavilion, which was the central meeting area. Um, families cannot live together. He separates spouses from their children and there's no way for them to really talk. And it's forbidden to complain about Jonestown. If you complain about Jonestown, even the heat, he would have people come before the front of the pavilion and then have his, his guards knock them around. Wow. Right. Mm-hmm. So it quickly devolves into this hellacious atmosphere. And what happened was word got out about what was really happening in Jonestown, that people were being held against their will, and that all the letters that they were writing home were dictated and censored um, because one of his aides named Debbie Layton defected. Mm. She was a young woman. She had the ability to travel between Jonestown and the jungle in the capital of Guyana, which is Georgetown. And so... On one of those trips to the capital, she went to the U.S. Embassy and told the ambassador what was going on in Jonestown, and he got her a ticket out of there and back to San Francisco. Uh, wow. Yeah. So that's how, that's how it She's the out. one that broke mm-hmm. it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So Did- she broke the news. She, she talked to the Chronicle, and she said, look, you know, he's planning on killing everybody in Jonestown. Something needs to be done right away. But what happened? Well, the embassy, the U.S. embassy in Guyana would go up there and say, so are you planning on killing everybody in Jonestown? <laughs> and he'd look at them yeah, and sure, say, yeah. you're crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? Mm. <laughs> that right? would be, yeah, that's not the way to approach it. So. Mm-hmm. But then they would go, you know, because they kept, you know, she kept insisting and a couple other people defected and they would take individuals out you know, in the field, for example, to talk to them about their experience in Jonestown. But he, again, he had coached them on what to say and what not to say. Mm. Right. This, I mean, this is just, we're going to actually take a quick break because we have a sponsor that okay. we have to make a little money here. Uh, so, but uh, <laughs> this is so fascinating. Uh, it's hard to even sometimes ask yeah. a question because I'm just <laughs> so entranced in what you're saying. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna take just a quick break. Okay. We have Julia Shears uh, here. She uh, is an author, uh, a, a journalist, and she wrote a book. It's called A Thousand Lives: The Untold Story of Jonestown. 
Uh, if you don't know, you know, a lot of people that are younger may not know about Jonestown mm. and Jim Jones. And this is something that, you know, it, 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 that I think people should know about. Uh, it's, it, you know, these lives should not be uh, lost in vain. So uh, check it out. But uh, uh, we're going to mm. take a quick break. Uh, this is Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Tony Sweet. Rachel Lang. I'm Eddie. And we're <laughs> you're not Eddie. You're Captain Ron. Today I'm Eddie. Okay, you're Captain Ron. <laughs> All right, we're going to be right back. Uh, don't go anywhere. United States Pharmacopeia USP sets the standard for most food supplements and are used in over 95% of all vitamin and mineral supplements in the world. The problem is that these products have never appeared in any living tissue. They're created in laboratories and are not recognizable to the body's metabolism. Grown by Nature products are different because they use renatured ingredients, proprietary blends of essential vitamins and minerals with cofactors of proteins, lipids, and complex carbohydrates. Over 50 studies have been conducted on renatured nutrients, and over 20 have been published in peer-reviewed journals proclaiming their superiority. As a result, Grown by Nature vitamins and supplements are now recognized as simply the best available. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 and order your Grown by Nature products today. We are what we eat, and since we are of nature, we should eat foods in their natural form. Only Grown by Nature offers a full line of renatured nutrients. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 because not all products are grown by nature, but they should be. All right, we're back. This is Tony Sweet on Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Tony Sweet. We have... I'm Rachel. I'm Captain Ron. And we have on the phone with us Julia Shears. She is an author of an amazing book called A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Jonestown. And I'm going to go ahead and let Rachel bring us back in with a question. Yes. I, so this is all so fascinating. And, um, and, and one of the things that you can't help but discover when you're reading anything about this is the conspiracy theories. Um, mm. na namely, that this was somehow part of an, a CIA mind control type of experiment. Uh, what what did, did you find, if anything, about any of these conspiracy theories? There's no evidence for any of them. But I think people cannot wrap their brains around the fact that this happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they want some easy explanation. Oh, it was the CIA who wanted to kill the socialists or wanted to kill black people. You know, in African-American communities, there's a lot of this conspiracy that, you know, the white government wants to keep them down. None of that happened. I mean, the beauty of the FBI files is that they delineate day by day what was going on in Jonestown. As Jim Jones, um, you know, so people go down there, they're excited, they're going to take place in this ideal society. They think that they can stay for a couple of months and leave at any time. And then Jim Jones says, nope, you're not going anywhere. You're stuck here. They're trapped in the jungle. And then almost immediately after he gets down there, he starts talking about this idea of revolutionary suicide, which he never brought up in all of his years here in the United States. Did you ever talk to somebody that was a survivor uh, mm -hmm. that, because there was very few that survived, I mean, if, if, I think just a few, but did, did you, or if you didn't get to talk to them or even do research on when he said, mentioned the revolutionary suicide, what was people's reaction? Because I couldn't imagine... 900 right. and some people going, yeah, I'm in. Okay, maybe. <laughs> right. You know, it's like right. I couldn't imagine. Oh, suicide. Sounds That's like right. a good idea. Yeah, I could not imagine, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. especially the parents right. with the children. I, I mean, what, uh, what, what, what did you find? It, they were outraged. They were shocked. They, the first night that he brought it up in the pavilion, he, you know, people were just looking at each other like, you know, what, what is he talking about, you know? And they argued and they said, you know, we didn't come down here to die. We came down here to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so there are many, many nights, night after night, where he is hitting home this idea that someday we might all have to die for socialism. And, that, you know, the parents especially and everyone is, is pushing back, right? So what did he do? He started forcing a vote, right? And so the first time he had a vote, the only two people who raised their hands were his aides who were supporting him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he would make everyone stay up until everyone raised their hands. So he'd have them all hours of the night. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the survivors told me 
it was it got to be boring to talk about suicide and you just raised your hand because you wanted to go to bed because you knew Uh at six in the morning you'd have to get up and start working in the field yeah well what what pops into my head is Mm -hmm. and i know i'm not i'm I'm trying not to go off topic meaning uh, this off topic but 9 11 uh i think it was flight over was it over Pennsylvania? I don't remember the the flight number. But when people finally got up and says, "No, we're not, we're not gonna," and they charge the front. They charge yeah. the mm-hmm. front. Right. I couldn't imagine nine hundred people. How many people that were in the circle with Jim Jones? Okay, so let's talk about what happened the last night. Okay, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Since you, since you're jumping forward. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, that's that's okay. So, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what happened with Congressman Ryan. Okay. So, first of all, Debbie Layton defects. She gets out. She comes back to San Francisco. She's interviewed in the media saying that Jim Jones is going to kill everybody in Jonestown. Do something. So, the embassy goes down there. Are you going to kill everyone in Jonestown? And Jim Jones says, no. What are you talking about? And then what else could they do, Right. There was also this thing called freedom of religion. They can't interfere in a church's uh, business, right? So there's this congressman from San Mateo, California, named Leo Ryan. And a couple of the concerned relatives, which was a group of relatives with family members in Jonestown, approaches Leo Ryan and says, we're, we're very worried about our family members in Jonestown. Will you please go down there and check that they're okay? So November 1978, Leo Ryan goes to Jonestown with an entourage of reporters. On the first night, everybody knows their place. They have rehearsed their answers. They're telling them they love Jonestown. It's awesome. They would never want to go back to the United States. But then somebody slips one of Jim or one of Leo Ryan's aides a note. Mm -hmm. And that aide was Jackie Spear, who now serves in his spot, saying, please help us get out of Jonestown. We're being held against our will. They weren't supposed to approach any of the media or Leo Ryan, the residents of Jonestown were not. So what happened? Somebody sees. A person, this resident slips Jackie Spears a note, and then all of a sudden there's this rush of people who want to leave with Leo Ryan. The tide is turned. Jim Jones's house of cards is about to fall down. Leo Ryan is, leaves Jonestown with a group of defectors, people who want to come back to the United States, and as they're waiting for their plane to show up on this jungle airstrip, Jim Jones, <clears throat> excuse me, sends out his his guards, his thugs, and they go and they shoot down Leo Ryan, several of the news media, and a defector, Hmm. right? They mow down seven people, five people on this airstrip. And then when they return to Jonestown, now is Jim Jones's chance. He tells everyone in Jonestown that what has happened And that they will soon be surrounded by the Americans, by the Guyanese army, by mercenaries who will come in and torture them. So now is the time to take this potion, quote unquote, and slip over to the other side Mm -hmm. because he also preached reincarnation. Wow. Okay. So they have this bat and it wasn't Kool-Aid. It was Flavor-Aid, this cheap knockoff. That the camp doctor has mixed with cyanide and a bunch of other drugs. And at first, because in May of that year, um, Jim Jones had done a dry run for this night with basically unflavored or unsugared Kool-Aid. He made everybody line up and then take this bitter drink to see who would line up and who was going to cause a problem, right? So he did this dry run. And at first, on the last night, people thought, well, this is, you know, there's no way he's going to kill us. This must be another dry, you know, a a dry run or rehearsal or whatever, Jim Jones grandstanding. But then they notice that the people who are told to go lie down on the grass are actually having convulsions and are dying. (sighs) But they are surrounded by those guards. 
with guns. And Jim Jones tells them, you know, you can either go and kill yourself with your family by drinking this potion, or you can be shot to death in front of your family, wow. right? Insane. So I think it was this idea that, you know, it was the lesser of two evils. Yeah, yeah, so you know at least you die, hopefully peacefully, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Wow. But, but, but mm. yeah. And that's one thing few people know is that, you know, they drank this at gunpoint. Mm. They weren't giving it any other option other than death mm. that night. Right. And I'm, I'm showing a picture of. But uh, didn't the he? Go ahead. No, I yeah. just I'm showing a picture of the aftermath. Oh yeah, right. Are watching mm -hmm. and I'm just, But didn't Jones yeah. actually end up shooting himself? That's what he did, didn't or, he? No, I don't. Did somebody else shot him? Is that correct? <laughs> Well, I guess it's well, a temple, I think. It's according, to the, according to the medical, medical examiner, he shot himself. You know, that's, that's the, uh, the autopsy report that I read, right? So he was basically a coward. After seeing the agony that these people went through after they mm -hmm. drank the poison, he, he, he didn't even do that. He did to, this. He, that's the point. He did a quick way. Yeah. What's that? Crazy. No, that no. he didn't use the Kool-Aid himself. He yeah. shot himself. He couldn't even do that. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And with all your research um, in the survivors, <clears throat> what or I couldn't imagine even being a survivor after that. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And knowing that, you know, almost a thousand lives were lost and you were the like, I wonder if there was a, was there a lot of PTSD uh, oh, yeah. with 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 this and uh, and what? I couldn't imagine to this day, after 40 years, if mm -hmm. they're still alive, I couldn't imagine that they are still over it. Uh, what did you find when you, when you interviewed some of the survivors? There's a lot of stigma still, because when they came back to the States, those few people who survived, mm -hmm. you know, they were called, you know, baby killers and sheep oh, and, wow. you know, all kinds of, of names, you know, mm -hmm. and it was hard for them to articulate what happened and how trapped they were. So the way my book is structured is I follow five people into Jonestown who represent dem different demographics. So there's like a young, and they all survived. Well, one of them died. Okay. So there's a young black man from Oakland, you know, who, who survived that last night and actually witnessed, you know, what happened. Um, there is an elderly African-American woman from the South you know, who joined up in Indianapolis thinking that Jim Jones could cure her. Um, in fact, did believe that he, he cured her of breast cancer. There is a father and a son from the Central Valley in California um, who joined. And the son, Tommy Bogue, lives about an hour north of me in Dixon, California. And he's great. Um, full of anecdotes because he was just a teenager at the time. And he had a lot of adventures. Uh, before Jim Jones got down there, he, he said it was the community was great before Jim Jones got down there and started talking about suicide. And then the last person of the five is a middle-aged white woman who uh, worked at San Francisco State. And she was a progressive white intellectual who, who wanted to, to do something to, to change society, who believed in racial equality. Um, and she kept a diary every day in Jonestown that she left behind. She did not survive, but she makes it abundantly clear how unhappy people are and how they long to go home, mm -hmm. including herself. She just wanted to come home. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy is that I, I contacted her relatives to get a couple of comments for the book and they still, you know, they see her as the kook, right? right? Yeah. Somebody who willingly killed herself. I mean, that's the tragedy. Well, so. well, okay, we're talking about the survivors, but what about you? Yeah. After you wrote this, after you you know interviewed the survivors, what uh, what impact did it make on you or you know, did it I mean, did it put you in a depression? I mean, to to hear those stories, you have to I mean, I know you're a journalist, so you have that kind of that yeah. two two different brains, but I mean, it must still be heavy on your heart. I had a lot of weird dreams and, oh my gosh, nightmares about, because I have two little kids, 
about, you know, standing in the line and what would I do? And, you know, a lot of, I had a lot of kind of strange things happen to me when I was writing the book. Um, I think sleep deprivation and having a newborn didn't help. Probably, <laughs> probably <laughs> not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Well, I, I, like I said, I, unfortunately, you know, our time's almost up, and I, I kind of hate to let you go because, again, so much more to talk about. But, uh, I mean, and this is this is just Jonestown. There's others, mm -hmm. other uh, cults that people, you know, these false prophets, as you'd call them, uh, out there, and mm -hmm. you know, and they're going to happen again. They're going to do it again, and I'm just hoping people can learn from from people like Jim Jones and say kind of be more aware of what these promises and and uh, false hopes that uh, he gave to yeah. almost over well to a thousand people but thousands of people that he that followed him you know before in other churches that he had formed but uh but this is a great great book and i hope people go out and purchase it uh before we get out of here i'd love to just um also, just to plug your other book, uh, Jesus Land, and, and for the people that uh, may not have heard of it before, could you just tell us about what that book's about? Sure. So Jesus Land is a memoir. It's about growing up in rural Indiana with an adopted black brother, my brother David, and being sent to a Christian reform school together in the Dominican Republic. Oh, wow. Um, so it, it's about race and religion. There's a lot of parallels between the two books. I, I, it sounds like yeah, it. It, does. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. Well, we want to thank yeah. you, and uh, we want everybody to go to your website, juliashears.com. That's S C H E E R E S dot com, Julia Shears. And uh, I know you have a Twitter. Could you give us that Twitter account? I know. Uh, oh my God. I am so embarrassed. I do not know my. Don't story. worry about it. I'll, I'll I'll put it up on our mm -hmm. on our page so people can find it. But uh, definitely, okay. thank you so much for being a part of the show today. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Wow, thank you. Of course, of course. And uh, again, thank you for writing the book because you know you're you, and I, I love that you you did it from the 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 victims' point of view and. Uh, give them a little more recognition mm -hmm. than just Jim Jones because he he's already had enough. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. I so, agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please come back and see us again. Excellent. All I will. right. All right. Thank Julie you. Shears, everybody. All right. Well, we got... Uh, we we have a little bit of time left, and this is <coughs> what I wanted to do. Is is uh, you know uh, Rachel is a, a world renowned astrologer. You are an amazing astrologer, and, uh, Thank you. and anybody that wants to uh, get a reading from her, go to blissenup.com. Yep. Uh, and but we we I thought it would be kind of fun. Uh, not really fun, but kind of <laughs> interesting. I'll make it fun. There it's we pretty go. Dark. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, it is dark. Yeah. To yeah. find out. The day that the suicide took place, November eighteenth. Yeah, November eighteenth, nineteen seventy eight. And I actually yes. even found the time. Did you really? Five twenty it's between five twenty and five twenty five PM. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I wanna ask you, what what do you find in the stop. Yeah, well, it's interesting because ev every global event has a, an astrology chart attached to it, or you can look and see, like, what was happening in the heavens right. at that particular time. And what's interesting about this time is that Saturn, which is the planet of control, and if you want mind control, leadership, dictatorship, um, the, the planet of, of restriction, limitation, entrapment, and Mars, which is the planet of the ego, Mm. And of, you know, like that, that sort of fierce warrior, powerful, right. like fighter uh, energy. You have both of those planets squaring one another, which means that they're challenging one another. And a lot of times this influence you see a lot in battles or in major mm. kind of, you know, in, in kind of war like situations. Right. Um, and 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 I think that this is kind of the, the leading the leading thing that's happening. Um, then uh, you also have um, Uranus. Uh, I'm sorry, Eris, which is a dwarf planet near, l right outside of, of Pluto's orbit, um, that is related to extremism and fundamentalism, and and also it's related to like people who have a, a big cause or have something that they're trying to promote, right. and they do it through like kind of violent, like sort of you know like rebel rising ways, and um, and and so these three planets are kind of in it in a bit of a dance. 
and and to me this just this just showcases that the the like anything like the smallest little drug induced or you know psychotic mm. break could open up just extreme violence and it's coming from the 8th house which is the house of death the house really? of death and rebirth and the house wow. of major like occultism spirituality wow. things that are seen and that we can't see like uh, with our with our empirical senses and so you have all of these things going on at the same time and and it it just looks like a catastrophe waiting to happen astrologically wow. yeah it was yeah 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 it, it definitely was and and so then there's also the piece of what do we learn from this and what can we what how can the planets guide us for future situations like this mm-hmm. And and one of those things is you know is uh, kind of tempering the ego needs the ego de- desires and um, and I think you know uh, when these transits are happening it's it's an invitation for all of us to look at how we are allowing ourselves to be controlled by the media by other people by um, the government whatever whatever mm-hmm. outside forces like this is a time of empowering the self to fight for justice and to take a, a stance um, in in defense of what's true and what's right and, and not to just lie back and drink the Kool-Aid so mm-hmm. to speak mm-hmm. so I would imagine that there were there was a, a, a lot of like a groundswell of, of act of you know sort of activity mm-hmm. happening right. in that in that group of people who who mm. wanted to stand up and take the bullet or who were you know fighting that urge i i, I was going to say i mean i just i couldn't imagine the men the the husbands the the fathers that would not want to just say and listen if i'm gonna get shot i'm gonna fight i'm surprised half of them didn't take off that's running. what i'm saying i mean 900 yeah. people that's a lot of people compared to maybe let's even say 100 people i mean yeah. come on I, w- I mean, but when you're in that mindset, you're tired, you're yeah. exhausted, you're, you know, the humidity, whatever, I can understand. But did you notice in our first show and this show, there's a theme that's going on in our political realm right now is fear. Mm-hmm. That when you, when somebody's putting fear into you, the people back in Salem's, in, in Salem during the witch trials, yep. you know, they put fear. And so they went ahead and they said, put these women in jail or, you know, hang them or burn them. From fear, what did we do with uh, Jonestown? They're totally. going to come for us. They're right. they're mm-hmm. coming for us. We might as well just you know go like, out. Yeah, yep. go out this way. So yeah. this is a good this is a good um, topic to talk about and uh, use for what we see in our political system right mm-hmm. now. Don't let fear uh, control your vote. Mm-hmm. And Tony, you want real quick? What didn't do get it. mentioned here today was that other than nine eleven. Jones sounds is such a big deal. Like you said, a lot of young people don't even yeah. know what it is. That's the most Americans that have died ever in one thing that aren't military. Right. Wow. Other right. than nine eleven, that's the most. Wow. Nine hundred eighteen so people. So up until two thousand one, yeah, that was mm-hmm. the most. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's that is a big deal. So, all right. Well, we are out of here. It's time to say goodbye to all our company. Are you gonna sing now, Tony? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but please go to truthbetoldwebtv.com. Check out all the upcoming guests. Next week, uh, Eddie's back, and he is going to Yay. be doing, uh, I think, a psychic guy roundtable. Uh, nice. So we're going to be doing a call-in show for you guys that want readings. Cool. Uh, I know Rachel will be back soon. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, definitely, Rachel, if you want to get a hold of her for an intuitive reading or astrology, go to blissenup.com that's right and what is your twit twit my twitter is blissenup and i'm on facebook and instagram i think it's rachel lang official on instagram yeah you can find me anywhere anywhere youtube oh, vimeo yes youtube yeah. all those good places great website uh and then captain ron i do have a twitter account it's at captain ron and, and find my show, which is uh, I am Doctor Four Twenty dot com. Yeah, That's every Thursday show. night, and it's uh, and one thing about that show I love that it because you know any anytime you talk about four twenty marijuana pot whatever you want to call it, you guys bring such an intelligent conversation to partially. Well, you know sometimes what I mean. and yeah right. When, but when you get Doc on a roll about yeah, I mean he gets into Doc mode and he he's yep. he makes sense for all the people that it's like oh just potheads. It's like no, there's a lot more to it than just uh just right. tr- getting high exactly he There's totally gives the medical perspective that's yeah. the idea we want to elevate the conversation yes. hence the name yes all right so watch us on youtube at truth be told with tony and eddie watch us or listen to us on iHeartRadio, itunes and we are out of here so until then we'll see you next week right here on universal broadcasting network thank you guys for being here i really appreciate Thanks, it tony. Thanks, tony. it's been all so right. great yay yeah. all right until then bye-bye bye